Hello, I'm Vivi Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with recently announced Democratic gubernatorial candidate Alan Weber, a former editor and founder of the highly successful Fast Company magazine, a 10-year resident of Santa Fe, a former administrative aide in the 1970s uh, to Portland, Oregon Mayor Neil Goldschmidt, and therefore a part of the transformation of Portland into one of America's most progressive and successful cities. A former editor as well of the Harvard Business Review, Alan Weber is largely unknown in New Mexico political circles at the moment, um, until actually until very recently, uh, and has drawn a lot of interest uh, uh, from many New Mexicans because of his outspoken views on education, early childhood education in particular, and revving up New Mexico's economy. The Martinez administration has accused him of being on the radical fringe of the Democratic Party. I guess we're all kind of over there these days. It's good to have you here with us today in the Mercury Library. Thank you, thank you. It's good to be here, and thanks for that introduction. I so appreciate it. In the speech you gave uh, to New Mexico's uh, Kids count, uh, Conference in June, you told the audience, quote, our gradual and growing acceptance of the status quo, say, 50th in child, in child well-being, for instance. Um, we're in danger of succumbing to a kind of sickness that uh, social scientists call inner kill mm -hmm. or death from the inside. Now, you went on to say we are creating poverty by our approach to education. Would you expand on this a little bit for our audience? Sure. I think uh, those are serious words, and I meant them to be serious. Um, inner kill is something that applies to individuals, but it can also apply to a whole community or even a state. And it occurs when you simply stop trying, when you give up and you go about your business as if you'd already lost before you even play the game. As I've, you, you're, you're right, I'm relatively new to the New Mexico political scene. This is the first time I've ever run for office. Uh, if I win, uh, this will be the only office I ever run for. I'm not interested in anything else but being governor of New Mexico because I take New Mexico's circumstances very seriously. Um, the reality is, as I talk to folks about what's happening in our state, I hear something that's very concerning, and that is people are saying to me, I've stopped talking because nobody's listening. And to me, that's really uh, one of the attributes of inner kill. You have some people believe that nobody in the administration is listening to them. And I'm talking about teachers, parents, school board members, community members, business leaders who think our state's in serious trouble, and nobody is listening. So I believe the first job of, uh, of the governor is to be a good listener and to pay attention to what folks are saying they care about, what matters most to them. It's hard to think of anything that matters more to people in New Mexico than our children. And yet we rank number 50 in overall child well-being. We have uh, a significantly large number of kids living in poverty. We have kids going to school hungry. We have kids going to school without uh, proper medical attention, uh, dental care. You can't learn in your schoolroom if you show up uh, hungry and sick and upset. Uh, we have to do a better job in the schools, but we have to, this is a system. This is a whole network of how we take care of our children. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said in that speech that if we don't do a better job with education, we don't do a better job with jobs, with, with work. Uh, we don't do a better job with creating an economy where our kids will have a future. The, the bottom line is really disturbing, and that is the data say that there's nothing better in terms of an investment in a young person than early childhood education, intervening soon, early, intervening prenatally, before the kid arrives, before the parents are parents formally. If we can get to children and their families at birth, and before they come to that first day of school, we have a chance to really help those children succeed in life. If we continue with business as usual, we will continue to have a high dropout rate. And a high dropout rate is a predictor of failure in life. And it's even a matter of health because the data show that kids who drop out don't live as long. So we're essentially creating a fatal disease for our own children 
by failing to invest in them. And I find that unacceptable, and, and frankly, that's one of the reasons I'm running for governor. I want to ask you a little bit about um, what you think the Martinez, or how you think the Martinez administration has gotten us uh, uh, along in these matters so far. And you know, when it comes particularly to stimulating our economy and, and to taking care of our people. We did an interview with a physician, a pediatric uh, physician, a man named Lance Chilton, who explained to our, our listeners that uh, childhood malnutrition is, is one of the great um, deforming uh, influences on, on a young person's life. Uh, and that once you're in that situation, it's extremely hard to break out of it. And yet all we hear about is, is, is this awful stuff about blaming children, and blaming teachers, and denying poverty, denying all of the things. Denying hunger. Denying hunger. So could you expand a little bit on where you think uh, we are at the moment and where you would like to go? Sure. Well, I think what you've just given is a very objective description of the facts on the ground. Uh, you look at the data, you look at the numbers, you look at what people talk about when they're around their kitchen table, and they're talking about the facts that New Mexico is stuck. Other states are doing much better. States around us in the West are prospering, or at least getting uh, out of the recession. We're stuck. And I, I can't explain the Mar or defend the Martinez administration's policies, uh, but I can tell you what I would do different. And uh, I think the, the basic view that I have about, say, jobs uh, starts with a different strategy for how you even think about the economy. You know, one of the best books written in the last 20 years on business and, uh, and management is a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. Mm -hmm. Terrific book. And in it, Jim says, most executives, if they want to be good executives, before they begin their to-do list, they write a stop-doing list. Things you should not do anymore because they're wasting your time and your energy. Great. So if I were governor, I would have a specific stop-doing list. And the first thing I would stop doing is what you described as the kind of battle among ourselves over how to go how to move forward there's too much blame there's too much uh, negativity and hostility you can't build an economy based on uh, people pointing fingers at each other and and trying to allocate blame secondly one of the things that that our governor has done that i think is really uh, bad management is when she came into office there were a number of initiatives that her predecessor had begun and she simply put on the brakes and i think largely because they were her predecessors, yeah. not based on analytics or uh, cost-benefit ratio or any kind of hard data, but simply a an ideological knee-jerk response. And businesses can't function when you're hitting the brakes and then hitting the gas and hitting the brakes and hitting the gas. And that's what happened with, for example, the, uh, the movie industry. Yeah. It was beginning to flourish. People thought we had a future there. They thought we had the crews and the infrastructure to have a really good base of employment, not just in big cities, but in small rural communities where you go to have a specific scene shot, spread the wealth around, spread the jobs around. She hit the brakes. Now, once she saw the harm that that did, she began to put a little more gas on the pedal, more, more gas on the car. But the problem was the damage had already been done. The crews got dispersed, people left, people said, well, we're not going to really have incentives, so why don't we just go somewhere else? And there are a lot of other states that would like to have movies made there. So those are, those are a couple of stop doing things that I believe are wrong. A third stop doing thing, I believe, is the myth of the great white whale. Now, I know you're a, you're a, a literary fan and you're a, probably a, a Moby Dick reader. Uh, our approach to economic development is kind of like uh, whale hunting. The idea is there are giant corporations out there waiting for us to spear them and drag them back to New Mexico. And if we just have enough incentives and we offer enough goodies and we give away enough of the farm, they'll all come here. That isn't how it works anymore, if it ever did. The truth is, uh, as a friend of mine said, who's an economic development expert, it's much better to have 100 clients who pay you $1 each than one client who pays you a hundred dollars. 
Because if it's one client, you are completely dependent on that one corporation or that one business. New Mexico is not a place where there are Fortune 50 or Fortune 500 corporate headquarters. It's not what we're good at. So let's not pretend that we can go after Moby Dick and spear the whale and bring it back. If it happens, fine, but we shouldn't spend our time and our energy and our resources whale hunting. Let's, and by the way, second point about that is, if that's what we're doing, what message does that send to our companies and our business people and our workers here? Absolutely. It says, you don't count, you don't measure up, you're not good enough, we can't help you grow. The only answer is some magic company that's going to move here. So I have a very different attitude about how you do economic development, in, including starting with what you don't do. Now, what would we do? What would make sense? Uh, a friend of mine a few years ago wrote a book about personal growth called Start Where You Are. Start where you are. We have to start where we are. What are our strengths? What do we have to grow on? We've got some phenomenal strengths. We do have oil and gas. It's part of what funds education. Let's be clear. Oil and gas is what part is part of what's going to help us get better schools. So we've got to deal with the oil and gas industry in a reasonable and business-like fashion. We have tourism. It's a very strong part of the state economy. I personally think we're under-leveraging it. Those are a couple of things we all know about. We have the labs. Those are strengths. What else could we build on? Well, my belief is that the answer to New Mexico's future is hiding in plain sight. And it's based on the talent and the capabilities and the creativity of the people in New Mexico. We're not a state of giant corporations. We're a state of uh, what somebody called a few years back gazelles. And gazelles are small and medium, fast-growing, agile, nimble businesses. Hmm. They operate at the grassroots level, and they add jobs by being very quick to pivot and turn and change. They're more entrepreneurial than big companies. And frankly, the gazelles are the people who add jobs. If you look at the economy today, not just in New Mexico, but around the country, the big companies are shedding jobs as they replace employment with technology. So bringing a, a, a whale here might not even bring jobs here. It might bring more technology here. The gazelles create jobs. So we should be looking at the companies that are already here that need the help and the support and the encouragement and the cheerleading of the governor to build their capabilities, not just to sell to people in New Mexico, but to sell to people outside of New Mexico. We've got to become an economy that takes what we're good at, whether it's growing food and crops or it's uh, entrepreneurial activities with arts and culture, or it's the, the capability of doing more uh, renewable energy resources and shipping that energy out of New Mexico using our transmission lines to advantage. Let's take our strengths and leverage them to create new jobs. And let's do it in a way that is true to New Mexico. Uh, I've always believed that the best way for New Mexico to compete for jobs is not being a slightly cheaper version of Texas or a dirtier version of Arizona. It's by being a better version of New Mexico. If we're the best New Mexico we can be, I promise you people will want to live here, want to work here. They'll grow their, their own entrepreneurial vision here, and the economy will start turning around. Right now it's dead in the water. There's no vision. There's no strategy. So considering that we're in the middle of a drought, probably a climate change caused drought, uh, considering that, uh, that water runs everything in the West and that every other place in the West is also suffering from these same awful conditions. Considering the fact that New Mexico has been a sacrifice zone for uranium mining, for oil and gas uh, sloppiness, for all kinds of mining activity, with all kinds of tailings and just all over the state, considering that, uh, that the labs have a terrible records of, uh, of, of environmental degradation, of dumping radioactive waste in the canyons, of all kinds of things. If, it's always been my view that if you're going to make New Mexico work, economically. Uh, you have to take care of its land, and by taking care of its land, you take care of its people, and by taking care of its people, you attract other people who perhaps uh, will understand that we're really trying to be a place of the future mm -hmm. in which um, these, kinds of, these kinds of issues are being addressed, no matter how difficult they are, and they're extremely difficult to get these 
huge. These are Moby Dicks, <laughs> too. These guys don't want to move anywhere, you know. Uh, they resist a regulation at every, every turn. In any case, I'd love to hear what you think about clean water and air and, uh, and uh, legacy waste and how your environment department would begin moving on, on those issues. Well, those are, that's a great question or a great observation. Um, let's talk about a couple different fa uh, factors here. Water is obviously foremost in people's minds in New Mexico, and it should be. Um, we are in a period of drought. I know some folks think it rained lately, and so it's all good now. Uh, the fact is this, is, this is a circumstance that is ongoing. Uh, the land is dry. The, the rivers are drying. Uh, we have a serious crisis, and it's ongoing. This, I like to think about it uh, as a, a reality therapy. This is the new normal, mm -hmm. and we have to accept that we have to live within our means. Uh, that's the reality of water in New Mexico. Um, we we should be doing statewide water planning. It's it's vital. Uh, it's hard. Uh, it's politically unpopular. Nobody wants to touch it because it's it's going to cause problems for people. We know it. But it has to be done at some point. Sooner or later, we have to all get together at the table and talk about the future. And I think your point is a good one. Whoever leads the way actually gains credibility and gets credit for being uh, honest and, and uh, authentic about dealing with reality. So I think that's true. I think there are a number of other components to the water issue. And then if there's time, I'd like to talk a little bit about the whole balance of environment and and uh, economy. But I want to talk first about the water issue. <clears throat> Most people, and I think the way you framed it initially, it's a, it, it's we talk about water quantity, but it's also important to talk about water quality. Uh, we have a scarce resource, and we should be very, very conscious of how we treat it, how we preserve it, and how we protect it. So doing things like passing regulations that let uh, copper mines pollute the water up to the boundary of their private property as if the water somehow knew how to behave to protect the <laughs> rest of the watershed, to me is, is really, uh, again, it's, it's un unthinkable uh, and bad policy and bad management and, and wrong. Um, I think, uh, obviously, the state government, no matter whose governor, is not in a position to decide how to allocate water. That's not uh, in, within the purview of the governor's legal authority. But what the governor can do is, and with the help of the legislature and, and regulatory bodies, um, create incentives and create regulations that encourage the wise stewardship of water. And we're already doing that, and I think that's an important fact uh, of how we will continue to manage our water resource. I think there's a big opportunity, there's a big opportunity to uh, to get some wins on the ground, if we look at the uh, watershed uh, management okay. issue. Yeah. And if we treat watershed management as an opportunity, we can uh, actually uh, get more available water. Not a lot, but some. Yeah. We can create jobs of people going into the watersheds and being very good at how we uh, manage that resource. Yeah. And we can, I hope and I believe, prevent wildfire that could be devastating to uh, water resources for New Mexico. And I think the final, uh, final thing uh, that I would say is that when it comes to water, the only new water we're going to create is through conservation. Uh, and that is new water. If you conserve what you're doing, if you use it more efficiently, if you use it more effectively, if you either do it through technology or through practice, we are capable of creating some, some new water. And I think farmers are already doing this. There's evidence that they get it, they understand it, that it's in their own best interest. I think communities are beginning to see that too, that water is an issue that is uh, vital to how we preserve our quality of life. And I think the, the, the best upside you could say, if you're looking for a kind of a, a good news side to this story, is that whenever New Mexicans are under pressure, we become more innovative. And the way to deal with water as an issue is not to fight over it, but to innovate around it. And that is the track to the future. So the New Mexico Water Dialogue is having its annual uh, meeting in, um, I think, January 9th. And one of their themes is um, 
is there a is there the political will to create a sustainable water plan in New Mexico? Now, as you know, there's there's 16 regional planning authorities, and they all come together, and they're working like crazy. One of the things that that's always kind of underneath these kind of conferences is the question of water and and the economy sure. and how it actually plays out. Almost all of our rural people are small business people, mm -hmm. small entrepreneurs that are working their tails off. But there is a, I know you're interested in in ways to uh, uh, to blast off, if you will. And, and I'm pretty sure that I've heard you talk about the environment as a way to fuel right. an economic um, resurgence in New Mexico. I think the the way we often think about uh, the economy and the environment tends to turn into a, a debate over trade-offs. You know, what do you have to give away to get something else? And I think what we have in New Mexico is a unique opportunity to, not to think of it as an either-or, but a both-and opportunity. And that is so rare. I can't tell you how many places around the United States don't even have the option of thinking that way because they've already done too much damage to their environment to make it possible. One of the things that's spectacular and special about New Mexico is the quality of life here. It's our calling card. It's why people live here. As you said, the land creates character. The land gives us a lesson in how to live. And that's really powerful. And I believe, and I believe it's possible here, for New Mexico's quality of life to be the reason that people look up to us, that we are the, the place on earth in the United States where we figured out how to have the best of both possible worlds. And I know it's true. I know we can do it. I know we can create an economy that is thriving because it takes what we're good at and it builds on it. Yeah. And I know we can have an environment that is unspoiled and that gives people the life they want and the opportunity to make a good, healthy living. Those things aren't mutually exclusive. And in lots of states they are because they've already made too many mistakes. They've already taken the wrong path. New Mexico is at this moment of choice. This is an inflection point for the state. And if we make the right choices, the right choices about leaders, the right choices about policies, the right way of framing the debate, so we're having the right conversation, I think in the next 10, 15 years, we can, we can absolutely chart a path to the future that other people will say, how did they figure it out? That is so brilliant. They managed to preserve the best of New Mexico, the history, the tradition, the culture, the environment, keep that safe and honor it, and at the same time build on it so that there's great schools, jobs that are paying good wages, chances for people to be entrepreneurs, chances for farmers to sell what they make, what they grow outside New Mexico, capture more of the value here in New Mexico, chance to do to be a leader in sustainable energy. I mean, these are things that are within our grasp. This is not uh, hard to imagine. No. It's doable mm -hmm. if we work together to do it. And I believe it's all about collaboration, cooperation, and a, a shared vision for the future of the state. A while ago, um, uh, an entrepreneur in New Mexico a man named Gary Goodman um, uh, gave a TED talk in which he talked about natural resource management as being the growth industry of the 21st century. And he was talking mostly about water, uh, but also about uh, about managing um, the the productive and, if you will, ho holistic um, management of the land. Exactly. Um, it's really hard to do, as you have have uh, alluded to, if you're in the a political environment in which everybody is squeezing each other and bashing each other over the head, and in which you have outside uh, forces like the like Alec coming in with with agenda for national and international corporations who want to come in and exploit our our resources and our people. And um, um, so how would you how would you, as a governor, um, with all of the power of that office? Which is considerable, but not, but not ultimate, of course. Uh, how would you work to keep that, that what I consider up, 
a pernicious influence uh, of ALEC and, and like organizations out of our thinking and out of our, our political process. Is it even possible to do that? The question you ask, I think, speaks to the, not just to the New Mexico political circumstance, but to the country at large. And uh, although I think in New Mexico we've got some advantages we're, that we, we're not using to our best uh, ability. And I'm smiling because I'm thinking about our current governor's promise that when she uh, was elected, she would in, embrace transparency. And uh, that's not supposed to be a, a, jo a, pun a, jo a punchline for a joke, but be my guest. Um, I mean, let's be honest. The, every, we all know from our own political experiences that um, sunlight is the antiseptic that cleans up uh, pollution it cleans up uh, any kind of corruption. And transparency is part of sunlight. Uh, I think the best hope we have in New Mexico not to let ALEC or others uh, pollute our political process is transparency. But it's also something more at the individual level. And that is, I spoke earlier about people's, uh, the question about what's the conversation in New Mexico. And people saying, I don't speak up anymore because nobody's listening. That is the death of the political process. Oh, if people don't believe their voices matter anymore, then we've pretty much given away the store. So I believe as, as a candidate, uh, the reason we've, my campaign has chosen as its slogan, add your voice, is the antidote to silence is speaking out. Mm. Uh, the antidote to feeling uh, hopeless is to add your voice to other people's voices. Mm. If we give up and we think there's too much money from outside New Mexico coming in through the Koch brothers, if we think there's too much influence from large organizations that bring their, that transport their policy prescriptions into New Mexico and think that money will buy New Mexico's future and we don't speak up about it, then shame on us. We're complicit in our own demise. Now, Again, why am I running for governor? I'm running for governor because I don't believe we should let that happen. I do not want to see New Mexico go the way of other states where big money, big corporate influence, outside uh, billionaires are, are holding us hostage to their policy prescriptions. And I frankly think that New Mexicans don't want that either. I think this is a state that, and I talked earlier about the values of New Mexico and I, I believe that New Mexicans are unique in how open we are in expressing our values. There are a lot of places where people don't talk about their values anymore, either because they're too cynical to even use the word, or they've lost track of what their values are uh, because they don't live close enough to them. Not New Mexico. You know, when you go out and campaign in New Mexico, you meet people who will be brutally honest about their values, and they want to know what your values are. Yes. They want to put you to the test. Yes. And those values are, are out for everybody to see in their independence and their self-reliance and their respect for each other and for the land and for the history and culture of the state. Those values are sacrosanct. And I don't believe New Mexicans are going to let Alec or anybody else come in here and dictate our future to us. As we're seeing in Albuquerque at the moment, uh, we have a, a ballot initiative, uh, November 19th, um, that was not generated locally. It's a move to ban abortions after 20 weeks. This, was a, this is a national agenda, uh, moves into our state, costs our people thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars to put on the election in the first place. Stirs up all kinds of trouble and all kinds of, of, of pain and misery. Um, this is also apparently uh, uh, the same the same move that was made, say, with our 15 uh, behavioral health providers here, where the governor actually runs an audit, accuses them of, of a crime, and doesn't let them confront the evidence against them. And it's not only her who doesn't doing that; it's also some it's also other elected officials, um, and and then. Uh, uh, destroys them and then imports her own people uh, uh, to come in and run the show. This is a this is a pattern that I think is deeply offensive to most New Mexicans, profoundly, um, and particularly Democrats and and uh, and progressives. So, what is your 
What is your take on how this actually happened? And is there anything right now that, say, a new administration could do? I'm not sure there is. I don't know. But uh, to uh, to re uh, to uh, to do away with this terrible slur and slander on these people who, you know, I believe have basically been libeled. Well, this is another situation where I think we've got serious business to talk about. Uh, this is not a subject to be treated lightly. Um, I really, you, you introduced me as somebody with a background in business and management, and my first thought about the behavioral health issue is that it's a it's an example of just bad management and bad leadership. If you've ever run a business, you know that audits are not meant to be instruments of punishment. The purpose of an audit is to analyze a situation and use it to improve the performance of whatever organization or part of your organization you're auditing. It's a positive management tool, not a prosecutorial tool. So that's a complete mistake about how to use the tool. That's a sign of somebody who doesn't understand management. Second thing that I go back to is, go back to first principles. What's the first responsibility of the governor of New Mexico? And I would argue the first responsibility of the governor of New Mexico is to take care of the people of New Mexico. And in particular, the people who are most vulnerable and most in need of help. And that's the people who are in the behavioral health system looking for help, looking for people to counsel them in their time of difficulty. A governor who pursues punishment before securing service to the most needy people, again, has a completely misguided sense of what the job is. It's a, the governor ought to be looking out for the most needy, not to punish people through a secret audit. So that's another classic example of bad management and bad leadership. Now you begin to get further into this issue and you begin to wonder why it was done the way it was. Why do we have documents that nobody can read, that nobody can see? Why do we have accusations that are unproven, but punishment is doled out before anybody sees what the evidence is? Why do we have people in Arizona being teed up to come over and take over jobs before the audit is finished? Um, this is all to me, whether you whether you think that this has a, a bad pattern in other areas or not, this is a case where you've got needy people, people who's very much at risk in their, in their own lives, subjected to what seems to me to be uh, inexplicable behavior. Bad management, bad leadership, a mistaken sense of priority. Uh, the books may very well have been cooked before they were written. And as you point out, it, I can't imagine at this point even how a new administration would be able to set the the record right uh, because it will be too far down the road and the damage will have been done. I think the most we can hope to do is, uh, and I, I hope our, my campaign will be able to do this, is to produce an audit of this governor and see whether or not she passes our audit uh, in a similar fashion, although we're going to make our books, our, our audit public so people can see exactly how she's doing her job. How, how would you conduct this audit, and um, uh, what are some of the uh, criteria uh, that you're going to uh, pit the governor against? Well, I, as I said before, I think being governor is like being the CEO of New Mexico. And as a CEO, you've got to be held accountable for your performance. Uh, most of us in our jobs at one time or another have been given performance evaluations, and I believe she's due for a performance evaluation. So let's talk about how she's done. This is not about person, personality. This is not about ideology. This is about the facts on the ground. If you were to produce a report to the shareholders, what would it say? So in my mind, New Mexico is a publicly held corporation. We are all shareholders. We all own a piece of New Mexico. We have stock in New Mexico. How is our corporation doing and how is our CEO performing? Well, we're number 50 in overall child well-being. I would say that's not a good performance review. We are very near the bottom in terms of jobs created since the end of the Great Recession. I would say that's not a very good performance review. We're not seeing a lot of progress in dealing with some of these fundamental issues of water, environment, 
We have a governor who said she was in favor of adopting Obamacare, but apparently is having a very hard time bringing herself to implement it with the uh, with the kind of enthusiasm and outreach that it's going to take to make it work. So that kind of gives you lip service, not real human service. So I think we can do a very fair evaluation of performance and see whether or not the governor should be given another chance to be our CEO. These days, if CEOs don't perform, they get fired and we hire a new CEO to turn around the company and lead it to better results. If we're a publicly held company and we're all shareholders and we all have stock in our future, we ought to demand that kind of accountability. And we ought to make it fair. We ought to make it open. We ought to show the books. How's New Mexico really doing? And I think on that basis, we're going to discover it's time for Alan Weber to be governor. So a while back, um, uh, we ran a piece uh, which, which said basically that the teachers are the real heroes in our culture. We're in a, in a terrible stew about education in New Mexico. Uh, I would love to hear what your plans would be okay. to, to get us out of this stew, to dry us off and to get us moving in the right direction in terms of, of um, what, kinds of, what kinds of content we teach our children, what kinds of standards we hold them to, what kinds of what kind of world we're preparing them to meet? I think you point out accurately again another uh, troubling issue in New Mexico, and that is what the current conversation is about education. And I've been spending a lot of time lately meeting with parents, teachers, even some high school students, yeah. uh, community members, uh, school board members. And what we have right now is, I think, in some ways, an example of some of the other. Uh, areas we've touched on already where there's an educational agenda for New Mexico that didn't originate in New Mexico. It originated in Texas. It originated in Florida. I'm told by my friends in Texas that the people who brought us uh, the current education reform movement were some of the fo same folks who brought us Enron. And, uh, <laughs> and I think there may be some uh, reason why they're about equally successful. Um, this is serious business too uh, because we're talking about our children's yeah. future. We're talking about the link between learning and earning, uh, which is really important today in an, in an economy of ideas and, and skills. Are we creating an opportunity for our children to have a good future? What would I do different? Well, you know, a number uh, a while back, the, the state sent a, uh, an application to the federal government for race to the top money. And it was required in that application that we have a public conversation about what we believe in New Mexico education should be all about. That was supposed to be the kind of everybody's voice gets heard experience. Didn't work that way. People were systematically not listened to or excluded from that conversation. That's fundamentally what's wrong. People don't feel like they're being heard and they feel as though they're having a one-size-fits-all education reform agenda cram down their throat. So I believe, as governor, the first thing I would do would be to try to have a statewide conversation about what we actually think we should be teaching or having our children learn in school. What's the purpose of education today? And how do you know whether or not you're achieving it? Uh, we, we really haven't had that conversation. Instead, what we've decided is testing is the only thing that matters. And so we've, we've replaced learning with testing. Teachers today are test givers and students today are test takers and it has very little to do with learning and education. I think the correct or a correct way to, to frame it is that we need to have school buildings as the correct unit at which we evaluate schools. We have to look at each building. The same way you would look at uh, your house as a unit. You'd say, how's my home? How do I feel about the way it works? How do I feel about living here? What's the experience of living here? What happens in a school building, one building at a time? And I can tell you from personal experience, we've got some great schools in New Mexico. We've got some great buildings. What makes them great? Why are those schools working fantastically? It's got nothing to do or very little to do with testing. Testing may be one useful tool, but it's, it's a tool, not an end in itself. 
So why do schools work? What makes some schools successful? Well, you started with one of the critical variables, and that is teachers. And we have got to do what successful states do, and that is recruit, retain, reward, and recognize great teachers. You do not get great teachers by punishing teachers. You know, the, I, when I was in uh, publishing a business magazine, the, 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 the gallows humor in poorly run companies was uh, beatings will continue until morale improves. And uh, if you apply that to teachers, you know, teaching will improve the, the more we punish you, you get a bunch of dispirited people and the good ones leave. And that's what we're seeing today is people are saying, I don't need th this punishment. I can take my talents and apply them elsewhere. And we're at great risk of losing really talented, excellent teachers. So I think we have to focus on our teachers as a great asset. Secondly, I think we have to have leadership in those schools. I believe that principals are absolutely essential in the leadership of a school, of a great school. If you have a principal who has uh, high standards, uh, knows the kids, sh shepherds the kids, sees what's happening in the building all the time, you know, management by walking around, mm -hmm. you will have a building that is alive with learning. I've seen it happen in my own kids' schools. And what do we do to get great principals? Well, I think we should have a principal's academy that trains and creates and produces a growing cadre of great principals. In the United States today, we've got the Naval Academy, we've got the Air Force, we've got the uh, Army, West Point. We need a principal's academy that trains leaders for education the way we train leaders for the armed forces. They are that critical to our national security. And we should have the best one here in New Mexico. I think that's fundamental. I think we should, um, we should take what, again, go back to what, what are our strengths. This is a state with uh, one of our most incredible strengths, we don't talk about it enough and we, we take it for granted, is how many different cultural traditions and languages are alive in New Mexico. That ought to be baked into our education offering. We ought to make that experience an essential part of being New Mexican and, and leverage that in a global economy. We have this diverse culture that is more like the rest of the world than any other state in America. Let's turn that into an educational advantage. Um, you know, there's a, I have a list of things that I believe are fundamental to changing, improving, what we're doing today, and much of it takes the cookbook approach that is called education reform, and it, it respects the part that are okay. Teachers aren't, I've talked to teachers, they say, we're not afraid of being evaluated. We give tests to our students. We know how to take tests ourselves. We're not afraid of that. What we're uncomfortable with is a punitive mindset that's gotcha government. And gotcha government doesn't produce great schools. This has been a wonderful conversation. And I know that, that you have lots of things on your mind. And I would just love to give you a chance to sort of open up and, and talk about some things that I haven't touched on, if you would. Well, let me, let me uh, close with a couple thoughts, some personal, some policy, some political. Uh, you started our conversation and you said, you know, most people don't know Alan Weber. And I think that's true. I, my aim is to change that. Uh, in the course of this campaign. But let me tell you a few things about myself that it might be useful for folks to know. Um, I was not born in New Mexico, but I choose to live here. Uh, and I fall in love hard, uh, and I fall in love with New Mexico. Um, this, uh, I did not have the great good fortune to be born here, but I do have the good sense to live here. And I think that speaks well of me. Um, I... Uh, I'm different from the other candidates in the Democratic primary, and I think that's an advantage. Uh, this is the first time I've ever run for a political office. This is the only political office I aspire to. Uh, I'm running because I really want to make a difference, not because I want to get a job. I'm running because I care about New Mexico uh, passionately, and not simply because I need to feed my political ego. Um, and if I'm elected, I will be devoted 
24 hours a day to the job of being governor. I think it's the best job in America because it has the most potential to improve the lives of people in this state. We have two million people in the state. If we actually started working together, collaborating, joining hands, creating the future that we believe is ours, I don't think anybody could stop us. I think we would set a land speed record for improving the quality of life for people in New Mexico. Uh, so on a personal level, that's that's my story uh, a little bit. Um, I'm a, uh, a guy who was very fortunate in life. I bootstrapped my way up from uh, where I was born. Uh, my mom and dad, my dad was a camera salesman. We didn't have money. Uh, there were times when my mom would tuck my brother and me under her arms and take, take us to the landlady so that the landlady could see the little babies so we didn't get kicked out of the apartment. Uh, but our apartment was right across the street from the public school. And my dad was on the, was the president of the PTA at one point. And education and the ladder of opportunity that education represents was something that they my my folks talked about all the time. And they said it's not only a ladder of edu uh, a ladder of opportunity for you, it's a ladder of opportunity for others. And so after you climb it, help other people climb it. And that was how I was brought up. Um, in terms of the the future of New Mexico, uh, the thing that I'm most optimistic about is how much talent is in our state. We are, we are an embarrassment of riches. You know, the old, uh, you and I are old enough to remember the great Pogo uh, uh, cartoon, We Are Surrounded by Opportunity. Uh, this state has so much potential in terms of jobs, in terms of quality of life, in terms of education, natural resources, it is profoundly inspiring to look around and see it. And as a governor, a candidate for governor, you get to meet people who are doing it. And I've been saying to folks that the great thing about New Mexico is that our future is hiding in plain sight. We have entrepreneurs who are waiting to be touched and lit up. We have a network of people who want to contribute to making education better. We have a network of people who want to contribute to solving the water problems, who want to contribute to helping deal with alternative energy and getting more good energy out of what we're already doing, get more out of what we're already producing. All of this is waiting for somebody to light it up, connect the pieces, and turn it into a movement for New Mexico's future. And I think that's the opportunity. It's not a campaign. It's a movement where we join hands and we become the best New Mexico we can possibly be. This is inspiring. Thank you so very, very much for being with us. Uh, I know our audience is going to really enjoy this conversation. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was a great conversation, and, and uh, the subjects are serious, but the conversation was fun. <laughs>